Come on, come on. The original Legend of Zelda was a very ambitious game for its time, setting the standard for every action-adventure game going forward. It was also successful enough to warrant a sequel. Apparently, this game didn't start off as a Zelda title, and even when it was decided to make a Zelda game, it was originally more of a spin-off than a mainline title, which is probably why it's so different from the rest of the series. Zelda 2 is often... mistakenly... Considered to be the black sheep of the series, but recently I've heard HPR Shredder describe it as the ugly duckling instead. After finally playing the game for myself, let's see if I agree. The game's story follows the story of the first game. Many years have passed since we saved Zelda and defeated Ganon. However, Hyrule is still under threat from Ganon's followers, who want to bring Ganon back from the dead by pouring Link's blood on the ashes of their defeated Dark Lord. Yeah, that's pretty grim. Dying isn't bad enough here, your defeat also means the destruction of all of Hyrule. That added context can really put the player on edge. So that's where the villains are at, but what about Link? One day, he notices a strange mark on the back of his hand. He seeks Impa for the answer as to why, and she takes him to the North Castle, where she uses his hand to unlock a door where Princess Zelda lies dormant. Princess Zelda, did we just save? Did we just save her? What happened? What happened to her? Well, no. This is an entirely different Zelda. We actually don't know where Zelda from the first game is at this point. It doesn't really matter, though. Impa then goes on to explain the Legend of Zelda. A long time ago, Hyrule was one large kingdom whose ruler used the Triforce to maintain the peace in the land. When he inevitably passed away, his son took over the kingdom, but only received one part of the Triforce. The prince learned that his sister, Princess Zelda, might know of the whereabouts of the rest of it and questioned her on it. When she doesn't give up the goods, one of the prince's magicians puts her into an eternal sleep. The prince didn't want this to happen and has her locked away, hoping that one day they will find a way to revive her. In the meanwhile, every female of the royal family is to be named Zelda as a way to honor her, which explains why there are two Zeldas. Impa then gives six crystals to Link, she also hands him this scroll that nobody can read, but surmises that he can because of the crest on his hand. Luckily enough, he can, and it explains that there are three pieces of the Triforce. Power, Wisdom, and Courage. Two of which we got at the end of the last game, with the Triforce of Courage being hidden away. It goes to explain that for one to use the Triforce, you mustn't have evil in your heart, or it will produce a bad outcome. The final piece is hidden in the Great Palace, past the Valley of Death. Before going there, he must defeat the Guardians in the Six Palaces, place the crystals in the foreheads of the statues, and then make his way to the Great Palace and defeat the last challenge. Impa tells Link that he can awake Zelda with the use of the Triforce. Jeez, that was a lot. At least in comparison to a Mario plot, that is. I could have just said that Zelda's asleep and he need to get the Triforce to wake her up, but, you know, there's a lot more than just that, and it's important stuff for the series going forward, so, you know, I thought I would mention it. It's also kind of interesting, a little bit, at least to me. So, this time, Zelda 2 is definitely an RPG, without a doubt. We got numbers, level ups, random encounters, and everything, man. There's no doubt about it. It's also a side-scroller, which is the first and the last in the mainline series, or even any spin-off, I'm pretty sure. This game isn't nearly as open-ended as the first one is, I'm not even sure you can do any of the palaces out of order. You also can't start the first palace nearly as prepared as you could start the first dungeon in the first game. I was initially a bit worried about this, since this game has a bad reputation when it comes to difficulty, but I'll save all that for later. Link's movement feels pretty good, although at times I wish he was a bit faster. He also can jump this time, obviously, and it feels really good to perform, which leads me to jump everywhere instead of just walking. You can also crouch to block attacks that are coming at your knees. Protect your knees, kids, you need those. I think one of the few things I forgot to mention in my last review was the ability to shoot out a sword beam when you're at full health. It's pretty useful in the first game, but extremely pathetic in this one. It doesn't seem to damage most enemies, and it doesn't even reach the other side of the screen. What is this, Metroid? Later on in the game, you gain two sword abilities the down and upward thrusts, which are very, very useful. 
the downward thrust especially, and it also feels oh so satisfying to pull off. This time around, you travel Hyrule like you would travel the world in Dragon Quest, not in a one-to-one -one overworld like the first game, with random encounters popping up ever so often. Though here, if you run into a monster while you're on the main road, you don't have to fight them. You can also tell by the type of sprite if you're going to have a hard battle or an easy battle, generally speaking, because I did find some of the harder ones to actually just be easier. The terrain you're on when running into them also matters, and it can even affect the way you move. This time around, Link has to gain experience points. Most enemies will give off XP, but if you run into infinitely respawning ones, you won't get any from them. Makes sense, I guess, but why have it be so easy to run into these kind of enemies so early on? This is a point in the game where you're most likely going to grind for levels, so I don't see why they felt the need to throw this curveball at you. A few months ago when I first tried out the game, I was confused about what was happening and thought that maybe I could only get XP from enemies a limited number of times? Luckily though, that's not the case, and like I said, most enemies will give you XP, so you don't have to worry about that. Leveling up will let you upgrade one of three attributes, your health, attack, or magic. In the Japanese version of the game, you could actually choose which to upgrade, but for us, things got streamlined. You'll always gain a level once you put the crystal in the statue, so it's a good idea to have leveled up right before you fight the boss, or at the very least, don't fight the boss and then put the crystal in when you have like one XP away from leveling up, because that's just a waste. Later on, it takes quite a bit of XP to level up, so you might want to plan ahead a bit and not get like the first couple of levels you get just by using like the crystals and like save that for like later if you can. Personally, I, I didn't have any trouble with this. I didn't actually really need to. I ended up grinding I think like two levels mid game that I ultimately didn't need to because then like the la I think it was like the last or maybe those last two crystals that I put in. Uh, I didn't get anything from it really because I've already was at max level. So yeah, yeah. Plan ahead or not, I don't know, get lucky like I did. Upgrading doesn't actually extend your meters, it just makes it so you take less damage or use less magic when casting a spell. You'll still need to find these heart and magic containers to extend the meter all the way. Also, yeah, we don't have hearts here, we have a meter. That's weird. You can find these fixed locations that contain all kinds of useful things early on, like this pea bag that contains a decent amount of XP, these red potions that will refill your magic all the way, and these fairies that will heal you all the way, just like they did in the first game. The magic refill and fairies can be found again after you game over, but the pea bags are a one and done deal. You can also get these items from enemy drops. Not the fairies, though. I believe that every six enemies you kill, you'll either get a blue magic refill, which will refill 16 magic points, or one of these notches, or a pea bag with 50 XP in it. And with the big enemies, you'll either get a red magic refill, or a pea bag with 200 XP. Pea! You gotta say pea every time you run into one of the pea bags. It's a gaming tradition. Another one and done items are the- Pea! It's really hard to stop once you start. I'm sorry. Anyways. Another one and done item are these Link Dolls that will give you an extra life. Yeah, we actually have lives in this game, always starting with three after a game over, with the ability to get a few more in a few different places. If you run into one of these before you're ready to do the Great Palace, you should not grab them. The only other way of getting an extra life is to be at max level and get enough XP to gain another level. More on that later. Every time you game over, you start back at the North Castle. Like I mentioned, we have a magic meter this time. The first for the series, and it would become a staple of it. The shield spell will up your defense, and it makes you look like you have the red ring from the first game. The jump spell makes you jump high, the life spell heals you, the fairy spell turns you into a fairy, which will allow you to bypass certain obstacles, and you can also go through keyholes in the palaces. Only downside is that you can't turn back until you leave the current screen. Apparently though, you can grab the items in the palace while in this form, but I never tried that. The fire spell lets you shoot fire from your sword, though I only use it to kill these tektites. The reflect spell makes magic attacks bounce off your shield, which is needed to defeat these enemies. I used to think that you needed the reflect spell in order to block these attacks, but uh, no, you can just block them with your shield, which I really wish I would have known, because a lot of the time I'm just getting hit by the blast for no reason when I could have just blocked it. Yeah, but uh, I mean, I guess that means that Link keeps the magic shield from the last game and brings it into this one, so that's, that's an interesting tidbit. 
Maybe that's some Zelda trivia. Uh. The spell... Spell is only used to find the secret here, but it can also turn some enemies into bits and bots. Finally, we have Thunder, which just like the Silver Arrows in the first game, is needed to beat the final boss. Normally, though, it's just a screen nuke. But it takes way too much magic for you to use it as one, so don't bother. Spells are only in effect until you leave the screen you cast them on, so you can't just cast the shield spell at the start of a palace and have it be active till the end. Because of this, you gotta be a bit more tactical with your magic use. You get these magic spells from these old men you can find in towns you come across. Unlike the first game, where people lived in caves and under bushes, there are actual towns here. Unlike the last game, the hints that the NPCs can give you are pretty useful. It's kind of hard for me to tell because A, this was the first time I was ever playing this game, and B, I was following a guide, not to the T, but pretty closely. But I did notice that the hints made a little more sense than they did in the last game, so that's an improvement from last time, I would say. We got the town of Raru, Ruto, Saria, Maido, Naburu, Darunia, and Kasudo. Those sound familiar. Most interesting of them all is Kasudo, since it's a hidden town. The people of the town had to flee their old home because it was overrun by monsters, which is very reminiscent of the destroyed town from Dragon Quest. In every town there is this lady that will <clears throat> heal you behind closed doors. There's also this magic lady that does the same thing but for magic, which she's old so the joke isn't as funny unless you're into that kind of stuff, which I'm not. This might be the only mainline Zelda game that doesn't have any sub-weapons. No boomerang, no bow, no magic wand, not even a hammer. Well, there is a hammer in game, but it's not an item that you can actually use in combat or anything like that. All items you come across are context-sensitive upgrades like the ones in the first game. The candle is used to light up caves, the hammer is used to remove these boulders in the overworld, the handy glove lets you break these blocks, the raft lets you cross this body of water, the boots let you walk across water, the flute is used to find the last palace and to make the spider guy explode, the magic key will let you open any locked door in palaces without the need to collect other keys, and the cross will let you see the invisible enemies in old Kasudo. Like in the last game, there is quite a bit of Christian imagery here. We got the cross like I mentioned, we got this angel statue that we need to give to this lady, and there is straight up a church in game, which I was not expecting. I forgot about that if I ever knew about it. I guess, I guess what I said in my Let's Play last time is canon. Look at that. Link went to church. And like I mentioned last time, yeah. Still, still doesn't bother me, by the way. Yeah. Happy Easter, by the way. Happy late Easter. Yeah, that's topical, I guess. Let's talk about the music for a bit. It wasn't done by Koji Kondo, which is kind of obvious actually, you can tell it's not him. Instead, Akito Nakatsuka handled the music. How wrong did I say that name? Please leave it in the comments. And he did a pretty good job. I love the buildup that happens during the opening theme that then leads into a hard change. Sounds pretty ominous. When you start the game, you get a bit of the first game's theme that then leads into its own overworld theme. Nice motif usage here, because we're still in Hyrule, but it's not exactly the same. Quick side note, you can actually run into the old Hyrule in the map, which is pretty cool, it's in the southern part of the map, and it's obviously like a reduced version of it, but you can tell like Death Mountain's up north, the bodies of water are where they were last time, it's, it's a nice little detail, which is also very like Dragon Quest II when you go back to the land of the first game. I should probably review that game. Uh, sometime soon. This is the third time I'm mentioning it in this review. I should probably review that game sometime in the near future. Yeah. The overworld encounter music really fits the idea that you just suddenly ran into these enemies while you were traveling and now have to deal with them. The town theme gives me a sense of tranquility. The palace music gives off this feeling that there is danger up ahead, but nothing that you can't deal with. The boss theme is a bit simple, but it's a nice change of pace from what comes right before it. The Great Palace theme is very, very good. I like it a lot. It actually kind of still sounds like the Normal's Palace theme, but just a bit different, which is fitting. I also absolutely love the End Credits theme. Really great soundtrack overall. There are a lot of enemies here. Most of them new ones, I think. I just wrote that and didn't actually count. I hope I'm not wrong. We do have some old ones though, like Octoroks, Gorias, Moblins, Leavers, and Stalfos. But we also have some new ones like Geldarn, Loader, 
Dari Daria da Daria. Yeah, these aren't as iconic <laughs> names, obviously. But then we have ones that are pretty much the same as past enemies, but have completely different names. Those aren't keys. Those are eggs. Gels? No, bots. Dark nuts? Iron Knuckles, actually. I'm not even sure if they really are other enemies in the Japanese version, or if these new names are just an American thing. And some aren't even named in the manual, like Lizalfos or the Wizropes, which are just called a wizard in Nintendo Power. And I don't remember them naming most, or maybe not even any of the bosses. So yeah, the first game's manual is way better than this one's. Regardless, enemies feel varied enough, and nothing feels overtly unfair. Until we get to the Great Palace, but I'm saving that for later. Combat is way, way more engaging here than it was in the first game. Link's reach is still pretty pathetic, but things feel more dynamic. You gotta duck to hit the Stalfos, the Iron Knuckle will block your attacks if you just spam the button at them, these guys throw stuff at you, these other guys remind me of the Hammer Brothers from Super Mario Brothers, the Daria have a small window that you need to take advantage of in order to hit them and not get hit in the face by their axes. You have to be more attentive here, your actions have to be more purposeful. That being said, it's still an NES game, so you know, it's not like rocket science. You can hit high and low, enemies can hit you high and low, it's, it's just that. That being said, I still really like the combat here. It feels good to have to bob and weave while fighting these guys, especially in the palaces. The Iron Knuckle is just way, way more fun to fight than the Dark Nuts ever were. I was expecting to have a harder time based on what I had seen and heard about the game in the past, but things aren't really that bad here. Things overall aren't too bad either. The reason why this game gets called the Black Sheep of the series is because, one, it's a side-scroller, not an overhead, and two, because of the difficulty. I've heard this game get compared to Lost Levels and Ghosts and Goblins. I mean, you have to start all the way back at Hyrule Palace if you ever game over, and then have to walk all the way back to where you were, at which point you're probably going to end up losing a few lives along the way, and then game over shortly after that. And then you have to do it all over again. Look at all these bottomless pits that are all over the place. Look at these crazy difficult enemies. This game is borderline impossible. I don't get it. I, I, I Seriously, I just did not have that hard of a time playing this game. Sure, I died a lot, but it never felt unfair. And even when I did end up gaming over and had to reset from the beginning, I was never more than like 5 minutes away from where I was before, so it wasn't that big of a deal. Also, when you die in the first game, you start with 3 hearts. You're gonna have to leave the dungeon and go to a fairy fountain anyways. It's not that much less time to like re-recoup yourself than it is in this game to just get back to the place you were. You know, it's pretty comparable actually, so... Yeah, it's not that big of a deal. Hyrule is big, but not big enough to have gaming over be a real setback. Once you get the hammer, you can get back to most places pretty easily. The hardest enemies were the Blue Iron Knuckles, since they throw stuff at you and it's hard to block at times, but the game isn't littered with them. And you can also turn them into bots with a spell spell, so you know, how threatening are they really? Things felt fair. It wasn't easy, but it felt firm. There was never a point in the game where I felt like I couldn't handle what was being thrown at me. Even when I lost to a boss and had to make my way back, I wasn't upset. I was eager to get back and try again. I mean, I was a bit upset here, but that was for completely different reasons. I didn't want to copy the intro. I didn't want to copy the intro. That all being said, Me. like the first game, I would recommend using a guide of some sort. I know that some hardcore Zelda enthusiasts will disagree with this, but come on, we don't even get a terrible version of the map like last time. I personally use the old Super Gaming Brothers Let's Play of the game as my guide. I would watch a video or two ahead of time before I played, and then on my own accord went and play, never playing alongside the video itself. I'm no pro gamer or nothing, I'm not bragging, I, I gamed over 20 plus times. It's just not as hard as people make it out to be. Do not do yourself the disservice of playing this game with save states. Get the idea that you need to use them in order to have a good time with this game out of your head, because it's completely untrue. The only part of the game that's as hard as people make it out to be 
is the journey to the Great Palace. But we'll get to that later. Let's talk about the bosses first. They are much harder than the ones in the first game. Or at the very least, you're not going to be able to beat them as quick as you can in that game. Similar to the enemies, the bosses require you to pay attention to how they move and attack. Horsehead has a mace that he will cock back and swing at you, giving you a small window to hit him in the head, and then move out of the way. It is really satisfying to pull this off. You know, you hit him, and he just barely misses you. Multiple times in a row? Yeah, it feels really good. I almost perfect him, and then I, I didn't, which was unfortunate. But still, felt really good. And also really simple to grasp. Helmet Head's weakness is also his head. As you hit him, his helmets will come off and start to fly around shooting blasts at you, kind of like Gleok did in the last game. One thing I didn't like about this boss is that it was really easy to off-screen him, at which point I have to back up and wait for him to come back onto the screen. Next boss is a blue iron knuckle on horseback. At this point, you have the downward thrust, which makes the first part pretty boring. It's mostly just a waiting game. Then it just turns into a normal fight with a blue iron knuckle, which, yeah, this enemy is, I, I guess, boss worthy? Kind of kind of silly, though, I guess. A little bit. I don't know. I mean, it's just a blue iron knuckle, you know? <laughs> it kind of be like in the first game with the, with the final boss was a room full of, of dark nuts. Blue dark nuts. Yeah, that'd be kind of weird, wouldn't it? This fight has the same off-screen problem as the last, except here it's even worse because the blue iron knuckle is always backing up from you, basically. So, yeah, you just... Yeah, it's, it's worse. This is the only boss that gets reused as a mini-boss in a later palace. Next we have Karak, the easiest boss in this game. All you have to do is cast Reflect and sit in the corner, and that's it. You just watch his magic bounce back at him, and that's it. I still managed to die to him though, because <laughs> I was low on health, which sucked. Next we have an American exclusive boss, which is named Guma. But I've heard that that was a translation error, Guma being a different enemy entirely. Unlike the other bosses, you have to hit him in his body and not his head. He isn't that much more difficult than Horsehead, and he works basically the same. The timing obviously is a bit different, but you know. Barba is the mistranslated name of Volvagia, which is probably the hardest on paper, but that's simply because you can die very, very quickly here. And that's because of these bottomless pits. Damn it! Well, that sucked. Apparently you can stand close to him and duck and he won't be able to hit you with his fire. I wish I knew that. I do really like his design. He is my favorite of the bunch here. I didn't really go into the palaces here, but that's because I don't think they are as unique from each other as the dungeons were in the first game. Maybe that's just because it's harder for me to recall the layout of these places because we're dealing with a side scroller. You know, everything's 2D, you don't get a, a top-down view kind of harder hard to remember. While playing though, I, 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 it was fine, like I didn't, I never felt like lost, really, like backtracking, like I, I kind of, I remembered for the most part where to go, but that could be because I kind of knew where to go already because of the guide, but I don't know. Does anybody else feel like a side scroller isn't like, isn't as easy to remember where you came from or went? Because you know, you, you're always either going left or right anyways. Is it just me? I don't know. I mean, you can't go up and down in the elevators, but it's not as, common as in the first game going up down left or right you're usually just going left or right i don't know might just be a me thing that being said i do really like the unique colors and designs they have apparently that was a exclusive thing to the american version which is interesting after placing all six crystals in their statues you can start to make your way towards the valley of death before that you should go out and collect as many link dolls as you can because you're gonna need them fuck the Journey to the Great Palace. This is the one part of the game that genuinely sucks. Why? Bottomless Pits plus the MOA. They move pretty erratically, they hit pretty hard, and they zap XP from you. And they're just pretty hard to avoid. Not only are there random encounters in the Valley of Death, but there are also these fixed ones that you can't avoid. It's not a very long trip to the palace, but it is a deadly one. It's mostly the fact that you can lose a life in seconds because of the bottomless pits. It's pretty cheap. In future games, if you fall into a pit, you will lose some health and they get restarted back at the beginning of the room, which is more fair. I understand that the journey to the Great Palace shouldn't be a cakewalk, but why have every encounter have these damn pits? Damn it! That's two lives gone in the same encounter. 
come on! Why is the jump so easy to miss? Yeah, I know it's my fault for not using the jump spell here, but come on, that's still bullshit. Well, at least we made it there. We lost all the extra lives in doing so, but at least we're here, I guess. The Great Palace, like Ganon's dungeon in the first game, is massive. Luckily for me, I already knew the way beforehand. Left, right, right, left. That's it. Whenever you can make the decision either going left or right, just go left, right, right, left, and you should be good. And all the other parts where you get railroaded one way or the other, just follow accordingly. And, uh, you should be good! Pretty easy! We still got some pretty nasty enemies to deal with here. Like these bird guys that shoot fire at you. These red bird knights that jump a lot. And these blue ones that will shoot stuff at you. <laughs> I don't like these guys. Without a doubt, these are the hardest enemies in the game. The up thrust is the easiest way to hit them. I'd say try and just run past them if you can, because... Well, I mean, come on, look at this, this is ridiculous. They also chase you when you do that, which is kind of scary. At the end, we have Thunderbird. And like I mentioned before, you need to use the Thunder spell just to be able to hurt him. But you're also going to need the Jump, Shield, and Reflect spells. I don't actually know if Reflect does anything here, but I've seen other people use it, so... I'm gonna use it too. Like most bosses, you gotta hit him in the face, which is easier said than done. He also hits pretty hard even with the shield spell up. Ah, damn it, now I gotta go all the way back. If you're wondering why I'm so confused, you probably haven't noticed that I restarted back at the Great Palace and not at the North Castle. On the one hand, I am a bit confused why the whole game didn't work like this, you know, just restarting me at the beginning of the palace when I came over in the palace. But on the other hand, I ain't gonna start complaining, because if it did work like the rest of the game did, that would mean I would have to redo the Valley of Death. No. If you're planning on playing this game, do not save after dying here. If you hit continue, you'll start at the Great Palace. If you hit save, you'll be booted back to the title screen, and then when you go to start the game again, you'll start with Sleepy Zelda. All right, Bird Knight, let's tango. He isn't that hard if you take your time. Having only one life will definitely make you more cautious. Yes, got him! Well, that wasn't that bad. Nice, there it is, we got it. Hey, where, where'd it go? Oh. The real final boss is Dark Link. You see, the note that Impa gave us did mention that to use the Triforce, one must have no evil thoughts. So it makes sense that the final challenge would be to confront your dark side. It also makes sense thematically. What is more courageous than to look into oneself and acknowledge the darkness within? Most people will think themselves as a moral person, ignoring the reality that they are entirely capable of committing atrocities that other people would and have committed when put under the right circumstances. Deep down though, you know what you're capable of. And so does your shadow. He is the only other one that will always know, no matter how much you try to hide it from others. No matter how much you try to lie to yourself even. You can't lie to him. You can't hide anything from him. He's right behind you all the way. So he knows exactly where you've been. Anyways, back to this video game from the 80s. Dark Link is the hardest enemy in this game, mirroring your attacks pretty well. I'm not gonna lie, I don't know how this fight works. He seems to jump over you after going back and forth a bit, and that seems to be a pretty good opportunity to attack, but sometimes I still can't hit him. Also, you would think that while he's crouching, you could just whack him in the face, but that doesn't seem to be the case? Damn it. I know I can just sit in the corner and poke at his knees, but I don't want to do that. I want to beat him the real way, especially since the rest of the game has been nearly as difficult as I thought it was going to be. So, we're going to fight him the real way. Now, even though I know how to get back to Dark Link, this blue bird knight almost always kills me, which means that if I'm lucky, I get two more chances at Dark Link. If I'm not, though, I die twice while trying to get back there, and I only get one shot at it. So, I did this. I did the rough math, and it would take me about 30 minutes to get the 9,000 XP needed to get one extra life. 
So I did that. Not once, not twice, but three different times. <laughs> Come on! What, what, are you, what are you scared? Come on! Come on! Shit. <sighs> Alright. Not even gonna bother with the extra lives this time. I'm just gonna just gonna go in raw. Young? Man, who would have thought that getting the Holy Spirit out of traffic would have been this hard? Rush Hour sure is a bitch. After that, the little guardian guy hands you the last piece of the Triforce. And then we go and use the full thing to awaken Princess Zelda. She calls us a hero, and then we make out behind closed curtains. I think this is the only time that Link actually ends up with Zelda at the end. I didn't mention this before, but Impa tells Link that the note and crystals have been handed down in her family for generations, in preparation for when a great king arrives. And I mean, the guy that had the Triforce before Link became king of Hyrule, so it only makes sense that Link would marry Zelda and become king. Mario is coping and seething somewhere right now. And I bet Zelda from the first game ain't too happy either. After the credits are over, you can restart your adventure with all your levels and sword techniques intact. Probably one of the first instances of a new game plus. This game is pretty good, and it's a shame that most people will dismiss it out of hand. Its negative reputation is pretty unwarranted. I had a way easier time than I ever thought I would, and I really, really enjoyed myself. I do think I like the first game a bit more, but this is a decent sequel. If you're a fan of the Zelda series and haven't given this game a try because of its reputation, do yourself a favor and give it a shot. It's a shame that Nintendo never went back to this formula for a future entry in the series. So, is it the Ugly Duckling? Well, probably. I would go a little bit further and say it's whatever you would call a game that most people haven't actually played, but still have a very strong opinion on, based on what other people have said about it, and those people are also wrong. I've waited 10 years to actually sit down and play this game, mostly because I thought I was gonna hate it, which is kind of funny in retrospect, because that's kind of how I felt the first time I played the first game. Going into it, I thought, oh, this is gonna be not as enjoyable, maybe? But I still had a great time with it. 
and it's, I would consider it to be one of my favorite games of all time, so I'm surprised it took me this long to get to this game. Regardless though, I can fully recommend this game. It's not exactly what you're gonna get from the rest of the series, but it's still a solid title. Next time we tackle the Zelda series, we're gonna be playing A Link to the Past, a fan favorite. I'm really excited to, to have, sit down and play the game again, because it hasn't, I haven't played the game since high school. And like I mentioned in my last review on Zelda, I didn't like it as much as I liked the first game, but you know, it's been such a long time that maybe my perspective will change. And again, I'm not gonna be playing that game with any kind of guide, because you really don't need to, and I'm probably gonna end up enjoying myself a little, a bit more because of it. At least that's what I, I'm thinking of. But before we get into that, I still need to review Metroid 2 and Lego Star Wars 2 and Dragon Quest 2, probably not before then, and God of War 2. As you may have noticed, this review came out way sooner than I usually do stuff. Since I'm not doing Let's Plays anymore on this or any channel, I want to increase the frequency of these reviews, especially with these older games that aren't that long and don't require, you know, almost three hours of analysis. Maybe the God of War 1 review did. Funny enough, uh, Blaine, Blaine from Blaine's Escape Corner, I don't think I've ever mentioned him, but Blaine's Escape Corner, you know? Uh, when I mentioned to him that I was gonna, that I was putting out the Mario 2 review, he went, didn't you just put out a review like a couple weeks ago? Like two weeks ago? And he checked, he's like, oh yeah! Yeah, good, good, good on you for, you know, that consistency. Which, at the time, I was just like, I, the only reason why I'm doing it this soon after the the, the Lego review was because it was my birthday. But uh, th then thinking about it, I went, yeah, there really is no reason for me to take that long uh, in between reviews, especially with these NES games. So hopefully I'm going to be a little more consistent in that regard. Sh shout out to the members. Shout out to the members. We got members, by the way. That's weird. Kind of weird. Shout out to the members. Shout out to Angry Canadian again. Uh, Angry Canadian really likes this game, which is pretty cool, you know? Alright, peace out. Leave a like, leave a comment, leave everything in the comment section down below. You do it right now! Uh, please. Please? Please. <laughs> Alright. Peace out. Oh, I had a, a Mexican jersey on this whole time. Did you guys know that? Did anybody, did anybody notice that? I just put it on because it was... Oh, the camera died. Okay. I just put it on because it's green like... Like Link. <laughs>